The Battle of Amara. The Battle of Amara was to prove a crucial turning point in the history of the Orphean War and the largest confirmed single loss of life in a confined engagement within living memory in the Segmentum Tempestus. It would also become the crux of what has since become known as the Orpheus Salvation Campaign. The protracted counter-assault to hold back and defeat the Necron onslaught across the sector after the disastrous first stages of the Orphean War. Eve of Destruction The onslaught had consumed more than half of the inhabited star systems that made up the Orpheus sector and had done so in just less than a hundred standard days sowing panic and terror on a vast scale and ending the lives of billions. In doing so, the invaders had thrown all before them into disarray, savage battles becoming desperate retreats and retreats becoming anarchic rout as the sector's forces were overcome and scattered. The invaders ravaging ever onwards to victory after victory. No imperial force available was able to do more than delay the enemy's onslaught or stay their progress. Then, seemingly inexplicably, they stopped. At Amara, under the oversight of Sector Commander and Governor General Calibron Larn and his military council, all forces that could be availed upon were concentrated and rallied with haste, none knowing just how long this pause in the attack would continue. As time wore on and no attack came, Lan's growing paranoia and seeming insatiability, at the time unknown in its particular cause, weighed heavily in the battle plans and dispositions of forces that were enacted in Amara's defense. The out-of-sector reinforcements that now began to arrive in response to Leon's cause were largely channeled directly to the build-up at Amara. Other local units from the worlds of the Arcantis Cluster and eastern portions of the sector, as yet untouched by war, were stripped wholesale of their defensive positions and likewise redirected to Amara, weakening the protection of their home worlds. An act which greatly damaged morale and planetary political stability, leading to outright mutiny on several occasions which needed to be brutally dealt with by the Commissariat. Within a quarter span of a standard year, the forces arrayed at Amara had grown to colossal proportions. With over 19 million Imperial Guardsmen in place, with perhaps ten times that amount of reservists and militia raised under emergency edict and armed and equipped with the Cadian pattern to the strictest provisions of the Departmento Munitorum. Foremost amongst the off-world Imperial Guard formations in martial power, and one of the last contingents to arrive in system, were two million troops drawn from the Death Corps of Krieg, spearheaded by the veteran 17th Lion Corps under the command of Marshal Karis Venner. Additionally, Several Space Marine chapters had answered the Orphean Sector's call to arms, including the entirety of the Minotaur's chapter, its vanguard elements now sweeping through the northern Orpheus Sector alongside a company of the Marauders chapter, which also deployed to the Amara system, while detachments of the Red Ceres and Nemesis chapters were known to be en route. The Armada, massed in Amara's void space at this time, was no less impressive comprising several hundred escort-class vessels and more than sixty rated cruisers and capital vessels of the Imperial Navy, including several Primus-grade battleships and four Space Marine battle barges with the ancient and storied Arica Dominus as their flagship. Seldom in the history of the Imperium had such overwhelming forces been seen in the defense of but a single star system. As the silence of the invaders drew out and time passed, the rush to defend Amara seemed no longer so pressing, and calls for more immediate action to meet the enemy's forces became common, but Lan and his council remained adamant. An absolute moratorium was imposed on any attempt to counterattack into the lost regions of Orphean space, or even conduct reconnaissance in force to ascertain if Imperial survivors still fought on isolated and alone, or even to aspire enemy movements and strength. 
A dark veil had been drawn across the sector's lost world, which Lan and his confidants seemed loath to disturb. The Battle of Amara began without preamble or warning. No deep-range augury foretold of the Necrons' coming, and no astropath or seer prophesied their presence in the currents of the Empyrean. At 1534202 local timescape, a massive gravitational flux sprang into being near the Amara system, its shock waves causing the sun to violently eject plasma and radiation into space in a series of massive solar flares. The fury of the injured star was such it reached as far as the orbit of the system's innermost planet, Auric, and flash incinerated everything on its day side in an instant. Across the Amara system, sensor nets and auspex scanners were blinded, Vox traffic was drowned out, and unshielded instruments rendered useless in the electromagnetic howl of the tormented star. Such was the confusion and tumult created by the sudden solar storms that it was not until the Sentinel-4 battle station in deep orbit around Amara Prime exploded in a rapidly expanding ball of burning glass and molten wreckage that it was realized that a long-looked-for attack had finally come. The Necron host had unleashed their wrath. The vast Imperial battle fleet on station further out at the fleet anchorage of Lemon and Amara III posted at what conventional wisdom dictated was the optimum location to best intercept ships, translated into the system from the warp, quickly brought backup systems and optical surveyors online to view the destruction. They found to their horror the image of a black fleet of unknown vessels silhouetted against the burning death throes of the battle station. The ships traveling at such near impossible speeds, they were in range of Amara Prime in moments, and there was nothing that could be done to stop them, nor even time to give a warning. The enemy had appeared within the walls. As the fleet raised its mighty engines from their idling slumber, a process that would take time that Amara Prime could ill afford, the Arica Dominus and her sister ships were forced to watch impotently, as flashes of golden and emerald light flickered around Amara as orbital minefields and weapons platforms were swept aside by the black scythe blade and spear-like shapes of the alien invaders. Systematically, Amara Prime was stripped of the defenses that so much blood, treasure and time had forged, and Sentinel-2, then Sentinel-1, each a battle station with the firepower of an entire cruiser squadron in its own right, were blasted into a pile of burning wreckage and left to hang like fiery omens in Amara Prime's night sky. The capital world of the Orpheus Sector lay open for attack. By the time the orbital defense batteries that shielded its high cities and the missile silos concealed beneath its grey seas began to open fire wildly into the skies above, the enemy was already at Amara's gate. Dark and unnatural storms boiled in the skies above, riven with vivid and corpuscent lightning, while eerie flashes of pale radiance flickered in the shadows between the high spires and tunnels and passages deep below ground. Tactical vox nets, still mired in howling static and interference, were suddenly swamped with reports of attacks both from the ground and the air. In the wide ceremonial plazas of the Kaloshin Hive, a spectral army of blackened iron had appeared between the lightning strikes and was advancing through the city streets, slaughtering all before it. A Doonrot starport, swarms of ravenous metallic insects in their thousands, had erupted from the subterranean access tunnels below, devouring everything in their path, and tearing apart the troop shuttles and gunships on their slipways from within. Elsewhere in the high city of New Vasburg, the largest of Amaral Prime's arcologies, was to be destroyed from the air, as the sleek shapes of doom size and night shroud class attack ships fell upon it from the storm wracked skies above. The antimatter bomb released as lightless black containment spheres by the night shrouds shattered on contact with their four targets, ripping them into oblivion and rending great wounds into the spires, which so undermined began to topple and crash down, 
bringing untold carnage upon their multitudes trapped inside. The half-submerged complexes of the Tritonis Hive were likewise soon undone. The city's defenses had long relied upon its labyrinth of flood passageways and sub-levels to impede and confuse any attacker, but found that they were poor barricades against the machine-dead things that came for them. Creatures with no need to breathe and to whom darkness was refuge. Assailed by mournful funeral barks that rose from the black waters bearing silent legions of skeletal, metallic warriors and scissor-handed fiends that crawled from the shadows to do murder. Soon, the air domes and coral-like heights of Tritonis were also splintered and falling, its watery streets echoing with the screams of the dying. Beyond the cities that were the invaders' primary targets, Military outposts were also soon attacked by the relentless Necron invaders. The foremost of these, the Polar Bastion Militaris, a linchpin of the planet's defenses, was suddenly besieged by a phalanx of hulking war machines that hovered soundlessly over the ice flows. Seemingly unstoppable by shot and shell, they closed in relentlessly, tearing apart the mountain holdfast with lashing blasts of energy and unleashed waves of seismic force that brought down the granite faces of the fortress's curtain walls as if they were made of sand. The kilometers of prefabricated barrack blocks on the Markovan Peninsula, built to house nearly a million guardsmen, were simply annihilated from existence, blazing lambent shafts of light descending from orbit and leaving nothing but fine white ash and few silica glass where once a vast army had stood rallying for war. Outmatched by an enemy that seemed to be suddenly everywhere and had the power to simply materialize out of thin air, the defenders of Amara, though thrown into disorder, nevertheless fought back and fought back hard against the invader. At Kaloshin, the massacring legions were met by the tanks of the Tekan 234th Armored Battalion, who quickly learned that even the small arms of the invaders proved lethal to their heaviest armor at close range. Knowing that to remain on the battlefield would mean swift destruction, the commanders of the battalion therefore pulled their vehicles back into the wide concourses where they could hope to engage their foe at range. In places, almost jamming the area up between the hab spires with Lehman Russes drawn up in staggered lines abreast, Manticore and Basilisk artillery tanks behind them, providing barrage fire support. At the first sight of the unliving ranks of the Necron warriors stalking towards them, the Tekan opened fire in an unrelenting barrage of shell fire at long range, through which nothing could hope to survive. Even as rank upon rank were blasted apart and scattered warriors were sent spinning into fragments, more took their place and yet more still dragged themselves up from the broken ground and began to reassemble themselves to haul their metal bodies forward again. The Tikan, seeing with horror that their fury was doing no more than holding the tide back, could not relent their barrage and keep firing until their cannon barrels began to glow dull red with heat as shells were brought up with back-breaking haste to feed the guns. A savage stalemate of sorts had been achieved it was one the Tekan officers knew they could not sustain for long. But little did they know that they would not get the chance to see how far their determination and munitions could last against so implacable a foe. For the valiant guardsmen of Tekan, death came from above and below. Testimony from the single survivor of the action, then employed as part of the shell-carrying train, reports that the danger went unnoticed at first, owing to a thunderous din of their own guns. The first he saw of their plight was when a lance of burning heat, like the blast from a melter gun, only far more focused and prolonged, instantly incinerated the troops in front of him and bisected a sentinel power loader nearby in a single sweeping arc. Back attributes to luck the fact that he and his fellows were on the return to retrieve more shells, or the munitions would have surely ignited and he would have been instantly killed. He described a huge black shape buzzing past, directly over his head as he threw himself into cover, and looking up in shock, 
He saw the sides of the spire towers around the armoured column crawling, with multi-segmented robotic insects of nightmarish size. Identified by the logisters of the Ordo Xenos as Acanthrites, these machine constructs propelled themselves downwards onto the trapped Tekan forces on tenuous wings of shadowy force, slicing apart armoured vehicles with their cutting beams before descending to smash and hack apart the survivors with bladed limbs and energy reed stingers. Anarchy quickly descended on the Tekan as, trapped so closely to each other, their tanks could not maneuver or bring their weapons to bear without hitting one another and their own troops, with no less than general slaughter ensuing. Tekan commando units attached to the armored battalion sought to counter the attack with concentrated bursts of hell gun fire and man portable plasma weaponry, but this counterattack was quickly overwhelmed when huge, rapidly moving, arthropoid like constructs erupted from the ground beneath the Tekan and sealed the trap. These killing machines, moving with blurring speed, were able to pass through solid matter at will. Swiftly, they completed the massacre, smashing through the remaining battle tanks, the carcasses of the Tikhan guardsmen dismembered and sent spinning away as the killing machines tore past. The entire 234th Battalion met its end in a span of no greater than 20 standard minutes with Trooper Yon back, surviving by crawling into a sewer culvert and being swept away, later to be summarily executed for cowardice in the face of their enemy. Krieg In the days following the initial assault, Amaral Prime had been blasted into a burning ruin, and each of the main hives had fallen to the invaders, the Necron hosts taking no prisoners and offering no quarter. Imperial resistance, however, was far from entirely spent, and as the havoc of the initial assault passed, ad hoc formations and rallying points soon formed on the ruins and in the areas spared either by accident or by design from the destruction that had been visited upon the world. Out on the Caralsa industrial plains, which ranged for tens of kilometers to the west of the shattered ruins at New Vasberg Hive, the death corps of Krieg were waiting. A late arrival to the muster at Amora, and with their reputation preceding them. The Death Corps had been deployed to several outhive areas across the planet, well away from the local forces' barrack stations. On the Caralsa Plains, the 17th Lion Corps had taken over an area of a hundred square kilometers of warehousing and manufacturer to house their forces. Finding these structures far less secure than was meted by their doctrine, they proceeded to exploit the underground utility tunnels that crisscrossed the area, setting their engineers to further expand them to create arms dumps and refuges. When the onslaught came, this foresight saw the Lion Corps survive almost unscathed by the initial attack, and once the firestorm had passed, they emerged from their improvised bunkers in their tens of thousands into the smoking ruins, resolute in their determination to drive the invaders back. The Death Corps first dispersed into the wreckage of the industrial plain, sweeping methodically across the shattered ground, engaging the enemy, linking up with other Imperial surviving groups, and recovering armor and munitions wherever they could be found. It was Marshal Venner of the Death Corps who took charge of the battlefield at this point, ordering the execution of several senior officers of the Orphean Guard he considered had failed in their duties and offering others the chance for glorious martyrdom in the front lines. Venner's command quickly grew to encompass over 200,000 guardsmen, as well as a dozen scratch-built squadrons of attack aircraft formed from a score of decimated formations, now dispersed into smaller groups for their protection, and using cleared roadway concourse designed for macro crawlers as airstrips. The disciplined Death Corps troops Veterans of such broken battlefields as Amara had become used the shattered cityscapes as cover from which to fight, using every tumble-down ruin as an improvised strong point and concealing snipers and lookouts amidst the mounds of the dead. In the days that followed, fighting against the Necron forces was fierce, the armoured bodies of the enemy providing all but impervious to lasfire, 
and their implacable war machines preternaturally resistant to most heavy weapons in the Imperial arsenal. The Death Corps, however, more than matched their relentless foe with their determination to fight, no matter the odds, and quickly they shifted tactics to a combination of long-ranged indirect bombardments with artillery and extreme close assaults, denying the Necrons' own long-range firepower as much as possible, seeking to overwhelm the foe with sheer numbers and bloody determination. These tactics met with great success, but often came at a very high cost in lies. Likewise, their combat engineers, skilled in generations of tunnel fighting, used seismic detectors to shield their bunkers and tunnels from the ravening assault of the Necron's cryptic scarab swarms, with flamer and melter squads kept in permanent readiness to respond to any sudden incursion from below. Marshal Venner knew that such gains as his forces had made were at best transitory, and with no hope of reinforcements arriving, and with the Necrons in command of much of the planet's surface, it was only a matter of time before his forces were isolated, surrounded, and destroyed, as soon as they were deemed a sufficient threat. Venner decided that rather than see his command bled and destroyed without gain, he would instead attack and pursue martyrdom in the glorious destruction of the Emperor's enemies. All he needed was a target, and he would soon be provided with one. Reconnaissance by elements of the Minotaur's chapter, trapped on the planet's surface during the attack, had determined that in the rubble of New Vasberg Hive, something alien had manifested in the darkness. Where wreckage had been strewn hours previously, a step pyramid of strangely angled green-black stone, riven with veins of pulsing emerald light, now rose up into the night. Drawing bolt after bolt of lightning from the troubled skies above, to strike its apex and cause it to burn with glimmering ghost fire. Around this pyramid had formed lesser citadels of the same maleficent stone, these being studded with arcane weapons emplacements and strange battlements connected to the main structure by angular trenches filled with glowing fog. Around the pyramid complex, the skeletal figures of Necrons moved in tireless patrol, and tides of scarabs and other constructs swarmed in and out dragging a multitude of corpses and wreckage fragments with them to feed the pyramid's hunger. Against this stronghold of the enemy, Marshal Venner ranged his forces for attack, even as intelligence came in from forward observers of alien stars being seen in the rent open storms above the pyramid, through which blasted flares of emerald energy that surged up from its apex with deafening reports. As they moved into position, each of the men of the Death Corps' assault brigades knelt in silent ordered ranks, crouching in the rubble and ash, waiting for the call to battle as the alien lightning flashed and flickered in the shrouded night. Between the ruins in which the Death Corps marshalled and the Necron defences lay was a rough kilometre of open ground, blasted flat and scorched, marking the killing zone which they would have to cross to reach their objective. The signal was given at last, and the Death Corps rose as one, and began to advance across slowly, evenly gathering pace as they left the rubble and entered the blasted ground. Immediately, the curving arcs of sentry pylons materialized on the walls of the citadels and turned to track the advancing army, arcs of power visibly flaring along the strange Necron battlements. Then the killing began. Howling beams of emerald energy blasted great swathes of men from existence, while Tesla cannons spat volleys of lightning that left anything they touched as blazing cinders. Hundreds fell in the first moments, but the Death Corps line did not waver in its advance, and now, from deep in the ruins behind them, their own guns spoke. Impassively, forward artillery observers had noted the range and dispositions of the Necron's own heavy weapons, and marked them for destruction. Venner had ordered that no munitions were to be spared, no cannon left in reserve, and the Death Corps basilisks and praetors answered his call with a furious bombardment, sending tons of shells into the air to fall like deadly rain on their targets. Instantly, the pyramid and its sub-citadels were wreathed in a mantle of flame as hundreds of shells burst along the alien construct. The pyramid flickered for a moment like a mirage on the horizon before becoming solid once again, 
One of its outlying obelisk towers blasted to fragments in a stream of arcing lightning. Soon, as the bombardment lashed out again, great chunks of black masonry were torn free from the structure, and an eerie howl cut across the battlefield, clearly audible even over the thunder of the shellfire. The Necron firepower was quickly redirected upwards, sweeping the skies and blasting apart the shells before they could reach their target, and in the respite, the Death Corps pressed their advantage. Surging forwards while Venner's tank companies, held back until now, roared forth from the rubble at a flank speed through the Death Corps lines towards their objective. As the Imperial troops closed to a few hundred meters, the ground before the Citadel burst open, disgorging murderous canoptic constructs directly into the oncoming Death Corps troops. The huge articulated bodies of the stalkers rose up and tore through the lines, whilst hundreds of smaller scarabs dragged men down, stripping the flesh from their bones. They were met with bayonet and flash gun, flamer and frag grenade, and the Death Corps flowed like a tide round the killing machines, while the tank companies entered range and opened fire with their battle cannons into the ranks of the shambling Necron warriors that were beginning to stream from the citadels. On the left flank, a squadron of Macarius Omega plasma tanks unleashed blasts like miniature suns towards the defensive pylons, heedless of their overheating cannon in their determination to strip the citadel of its defenses. While on the right, centaur carriers sped forth through a storm of gorse fire, which blasted scores of them to shrapnel in order to deploy their quad launchers as close as possible to the enemy. Thousands fell, tanks erupted into fire, and a blizzard of shells was hurled against a black pyramid which began to break and crack, smoke billowing and actinic lightning playing sickly across its splintering surface. Behind the Imperial lines, the companies of troops left behind to defend the artillery position found themselves beset in a desperate battle to stave off twisted, blade-handed flares that came for them from the shadows, just as Necron attack craft shrieked from the skies to strafe them into oblivion. The squadrons of Imperial Lightnings and Avengers that tore through the night to intercept the lethal night size of the Necrons were few, but bravely, they dove straight into the heart of the enemy squadrons, their weapons blazing in the darkness, each pilot commending their soul to the Emperor and knowing that this would be their final battle. The die was cast, the battle was held in the balance, and there could be no holding back. Already, tens of thousands lay dead on the blasted plain before him, but Venner did not falter in ordering forth the second wave. Raising his sword high and leading the charge himself across the deadly ground, the Death Corps filled the battlefield like a living tide of steel and fire, and crushed and toppled the remaining corruptic stalkers that barred their path, trampling the scattered scarabs into the earth. The Death Corps reached the outer citadels of the Pyramid Complex, just as their own shellfire began at last to falter. But for the Necrons, it was too late. The enemy was already upon them, the human soldiers swarming like ants across the alien fortifications. Surrounded, the Necron warriors were brought down in murderous crossfires, and the machine creatures were driven back and destroyed one by one. As for every Krieg the Necron slaughtered, a dozen more took their place. Everywhere across the structure, breacher charges were slammed into place and melter bombs were hurled into enemy conduits and cracks in the armored edifice. The violent detonation of the Black Pyramid blinded onlookers five kilometers distant and carved an ash-white crater out of the wasteland that was very visible to vessels in orbit above the battle-savaged world. Although elsewhere, the Imperial defenders also saw degrees of success, holding off if not repelling the invaders, the Necron invasion had been murderously effective. Each of the three major hive cities was in ruins, the plant's principal starport was overrun, and its keystone defense facilities had been reduced to rubble. The death toll had climbed into billions, and Amara Prime burned. The Minotaur and the Reaper. With its lethal cargo deployed to the surface, and the conquest of the planet well underway, the Necron fleet had turned its attentions again to interplanetary space, 
leaving Amarar Prime covered in boiling black storms and riven with the fiery streaks of wreckage re-entering its atmosphere in their wake. The Imperial Armada ranged against them, now arrayed in a vast echelon formation and on full burn towards the inner system, detected their movement, and its captains cursed momentarily. Believing the invaders would flee before the Armada's cataclysmic gathered might, leaving them no chance to avenge their failure to prevent the Black Fleet from bringing about the deaths of so many on the planet's surface. They were wrong. The Necron ships, turning with almost contemptuous grace, formed themselves into a perfect crescent-shaped attack formation and locked on to a direct intercept trajectory with the heart of the Imperial Armada. Exhibiting sudden unearthly acceleration, no human ship could ever hope to match. On the flag bridge of the Apocalypse-class battleship, Araka Dominus, Grand Admiral Jorg Carew, Knight Commander of Battlefleet Orpheus, watched the hollow spheres before him, showing the onrushing enemy with great apprehension. Although his desire to avenge the losses his fleet had suffered in the past months and the affront to the world he had solemnly sworn to protect, Unlike many of those under his command, he would not let his wrath blind him. The firepower of the fleet at his disposal was of an unimaginable order of magnitude and more than capable of shattering entire worlds through brute force alone, a fact that he believed his foe was more than aware of. Now, with the Imperial battle auspexes repaired, he could ascertain that the Black Fleet possessed less than a quarter of his own number of vessels and, by Imperial standards, far less in tonnage. The bulk, comprising what would comparatively be of the escort class in Imperial terms. The larger vessels, some twenty in number, were, according to the intelligence provided to him by the Ordo Xenos, identified as harvest ships. While the foe matched his eleven greatest warships with two monsters of their own. Together, anchoring the center of the attacking crescent, these tomb ships were gigantic, each being over fifteen kilometers in span and surmounted with strange pyramid like structures that threw off incomprehensible energy readings which baffled and alarmed his Magos. They had already been codified the Sun Killer and the Dead Hand by the Imperial Strategos and marked as the highest priority targets to all within the Armada. The force represented the largest concentration of Xenos Necron vessels on record, and Carew determined to give them the respect they deserved. Having conferred with the sinister Asterian Moloch, chapter master of the Minotaur Space Marines, the Minotaur's chapter fleet commanded by the lumbering relic assault ship Daedalos Krata, itself shielded by a dozen escort strike cruisers, had deployed into a second echelon, some way behind the Armada's main line of battle, poised either to deliver a killing blow after the lines had crashed, or to intercept any breakthrough force where the enemy's plans to punch straight through rather than engage. To his own command, he issued the direct order to all vessels to maintain formation and engage only as directed, on pain of death and although the captains of many battle-hungry destroyers and cruisers balked at the order, they knew that their lives would be forfeit to their own shipboard commissars should they disobey. With frightening speed, the Necron fleet had closed the empty void between them and was entering extreme weapons range before any more orders could be given or carried out. The Imperial Armada, though, was first to speak its wrath. Hundreds of torpedoes spat from the launch tubes of the massed destroyers, frigates and cruisers of the Imperial Force, blazing straight and true on pillars of fire towards the Black Fleet that awaited them. The Necrons came on undeterred, and as the torpedo swarm drew closer, they made no attempt to alter course or evade, and as hundreds of thousands of kilometers of distance was eaten away to tens of thousands. No avoidance maneuvers nor counter-fire issued from the ominous Xenos warships. On the flag bridge of the Arica Dominus, all looked on in breathless silence as the torpedoes entered terminal range. Suddenly, where hundreds of blue icons had flickered on the holospheres tracking the projectile's flight, red alarm glyphs now flashed frantically and simply disappeared. Scores of torpedoes simply ceased to function, 
rendered inert and powerless by some agency the Imperial battle auspexes could not even detect, while others self-destructed or spun wildly off course as if blinded. The flew that flew true were simply avoided with contemptuous ease by the Necron vessels, which sped past them at unguessable velocities, or vented their atomic spite uselessly against the impassive black hulls of the great tomb ships. Too few to have any real effect. Still, the Necron ships, blacker yet against the darkness of the cold void, came on. Within mere moments, the two fleets neared the edge of lance range, and the Necrons fired. On the bridges of the Imperial ships, alarm sirens howled as massive gravitational distortions were detected, hurtling towards them at speeds barely below that of light. And too late, the struggling machine spirits and cogitators of the Imperial ships identified them for what they were. Fragments of dead stars. These bolts of oblivion shattered void shields in bright actinic flashes and tore open the ships within with savage ease. And up and down the Imperial line, ships both great and small simply flashed out of existence. Alongside the Alaka Dominus, the battlecruiser Richtenbach, which had served the Imperium since before the Great Crusade, was struck amidships and exploded bathing the Admiral's flagship in fire and debris, shaking her to the core. Despite the tumult around him, Carew issued the orders for the Armada to come about to broadside and fire at will, and the closing void between the two fleets became a blinding storm of blazing lance beams and plasma fire, hurtling macro cannon shells and roaring missiles, whilst the Necrons answered with a fury all of their own. As blasts of amber and emerald light flickered out to splinter hulls and strip away decks. The two fleets interpenetrated and parted, raking each other mercilessly as they passed, and Carew watched in horror as a hollow sphere resolved the chaotic details of the battle into some semblance of order. The casualty list flickered on it as strange Mechanicus cant runes, which only a trained and augmented eye had a hope of being able to interpret at such speed. Fully a quarter of his ships were registered as destroyed or crippled already, compared to so few of the enemy, so very few. Horror mounted on horror for the Admiral, as a Necron fleet, having flown past, arrested its inertia and turned back upon their course, coming right back at the Imperial ships from behind. It was an utter impossibility, and yet it happened before his disbelieving eyes, the second Necron attack run was even more devastating than the first. The Imperial ships, caught unexpectedly from behind in their vulnerable rear arcs, blind spots created by their own dry flares, and already reeling in many cases from battle damage, were easy prey, and dozens died before they realized the danger or heard Carew's emergency order to break formation. The Retribution-class battleship Talisman of Grace was caught between the Sun Killer and sheared in half by its gorse rays, whilst the heavy cruiser Mendicatus was pulled apart mercilessly by a pack of Necron raiders like a wounded herd animal caught between predator beasts. The Armada's line of battle quickly fractured and broke apart, ships flaring and exploding like stars in the darkness. The survivors now lashing vainly all about them with broadside and battery fire, or spilling fighters and bombers into the void often to be cut apart by the defensive fusillades put up by their own brethren. The Arica Dominus herself turned as closely as her expert crew could grant her and caught a harvest ship broadside, the black hull rippling like water and finally failing before the fury of energy poured into it. The harvest ship detonated with a flash of pale green light, leaving nothingness in its wake. But the roars of triumph on the flagship's bridge were short-lived as a venerable battleship was rocked anew, as a triad of Necron raiders passed close alongside her. Her void shields down, the dirge ships hammered her from stem to stern, gutted her starboard lance batteries, and consumed her main engine deck in fire. Unable to answer her helm, the Arica Dominus tumbled wildly in the darkness, the bodies of her crew and frozen air trailing behind her as she fell. Through the carnage, the Necron ships wheeled, and fell like carrion birds at the feast. The two great tomb ships glided majestically and inviolate through the heart of the storm, annihilating anything that came near, 
while the pilots and crew of lesser craft that drew close were driven mad with fear or found their ships had become cold tombs for them, their power draining away to nothing. It was into this bloody melee that the Minotaur's chapter fleet plunged headlong. Having observed the battle on his own hollow sphere, Asterian Moloch, the bleak master of the Minotaurs, quickly realized that engaging the Necron ships with their superior firepower, maneuverability and range was suicidal folly, and instead issued orders for close assault without quarter or reservation of force. Their target was to be the Dead Hand, which the machine animus of his own ancient assault ship had discerned had been the first vessel to leave the orbit of stricken Amara and the first to fire upon the fleet. This, Moloch knew in his warrior's heart, was the master of the foe, their flagship, the throne of their commander, and it was this the Minotaurs meant to destroy. Adopting an attack formation in the shape of a bull's head, with the Daedalus crater forming the protected skull, the chapter's three battle barges the jaw, and its eight strike cruisers the horns, the chapter fleet smashed into the heart of the battle, engines at full burn and fire held until the last moment. As they unleashed hell from their bombardment cannons and plasma batteries, the chapter's war vessels did so heedless of whatever lay in their path, as stricken Imperial ships caught between them and their goal was shredded, just as were any Necron raiders smashed aside on the fleet's headlong plunge towards the Dead Hand. Two Necron harvest ships turned and opened fire into the onrushing Space Marine vessels, the battle barge Daughter of Tempests, once the pride of the Lamentos chapter fleet and taken as a prize during the Badab War, was blasted asunder and fell from the formation, its entire armoured force section disintegrating in the Necron crossfire. But the Minotaurs did not relent. Even when the Dead Hand's own weapons spoke and shattered the portside hull of the Fidelitas Lambda and sent a trio of strike cruisers into fiery oblivion, at point-blank range, boarding torpedoes, gunships and caseless assault rams hurtled from the launch bays of the Minotaur's fleet and crashed into the hull of the Dead Hand and its close escorts, the ships at their backs still firing remorselessly at the prey, hoping to open up hull rents for the boarders to exploit. A dozen assault craft managed to pierce the hull skin of the Necron flagship and found within a charnel house of stagnant blood-reeking air, darkened corridors and black alien sepulchres. Malevolent scarab engines were everywhere, and wraith machines phased through the solid walls to assault the attackers as antibodies would attack a virus invading a living body. The Minotaurs, implacable and unrelenting, fought on, battling and bleeding for every inch of ground as every turn of passageway brought fresh enemies looming out of the darkness. One by one, the Space Marines fell, their armor blackened and burned by gorse rays, bodies punctured and torn apart by the ghost claws of the tomb ship's defenders, until only one squad remained. Terminator Squad, Ixtalian, blast scarred and bloody, at last forced its way into the tomb ship's vast central chamber, a cold and haunted space nearly a kilometer across that lay beneath the black pyramid that crowned the tomb ship. Here, amid the chill mist and circles of strange obelisks, at the centre of ranks of whispering sarcophagi, wreathed in corpuscent ghost light, arose a great dais upon which stood the terrifying overlord of the Necrons in a shrouding cloak of raw darkness. It would be the last sight the warriors of Squad Ixalion would see, as a phalanx of Necron Praetorians rose from the shadowed mist and slaughtered them for their transgression. But it would be enough. The signal had been sent. All but close enough now to crash into the tomb ship, the Daedalus crater, badly wounded and with rents of damage scoring her dense armor, opened fire with her bombardment cannon at point-blank range. Their targeting solutions identified by squad Ixalion below, the fusillade of macro shells ruptured the dead hand's hull, exposing the vault chamber within to open space in a screaming vortex of decompression. The dead hand bucked away like a wounded animal, one vast arc of its crescent superstructure catching the Daedalus crater a glancing blow and sending the relic assault ship spinning with the impact. The damage, however, was done. The seamless shell within the tomb ship, otherwise impenetrable to auspex or target solution, was broken, and in that instant, the ancient teleporter engines of the Daedalus crater 
had fired and delivered their baleful cargo. As the pulsing shockwave of the teleport transit cleared, Asteria Moloch and his bodyguard of 30 of his chapter's Terminator armored veterans, alongside two contempted dreadnoughts of the chapter, stood amidst the black gale of venting atmosphere and confronted the Lord of the Necron host. Between them was no preamble, no warrior salute or declaration of challenge or intent. Instead, Moloch merely raised his black spear and unleashed its last blast at the sinister figure high on its throne-like dares. The gold and white bolt, strong enough to pierce the armor of a battle tank, struck the machine creature's shoulder and rocked the figure back, but did not more than elicit an eerie hissing howl, not of pain, but of insulted rage. From the cold air, a great glittering cleave-like blade of pale obsidian materialized in the Necron Overlord's outstretched skeletal hand, and he threw himself from the dais like a bolt of thunder, slicing open the first Terminator in his path with a savage backhand blow, as if the warrior's vaunted armor was as nothing. So was the battle joined, and in a moment all the vast chamber was fury, the sound of churning storm bolters and roaring assault cannon bleeding away from the air into the open void above. From the darkness, the Necron Praetorians and Tomb Guardians came, hulking armoured forms twice the height of a man, their gilded and corroded death masks glimmering gold and crimson in the fire-flash light of the Minotaur's weapons. In their hands they bore arcane staff weapons, blazing with ghostly flame with which to blast their foes to ashes, or great cleaving blades and tall segmented shields able to repel the deadliest fire. Soon, the Minotaurs were hard-pressed, a shrinking circle of warriors who had already accounted for twice their number, only to see the fallen drag themselves back from the ruin and be replaced by another of their kind stalking implacably from the darkness. Moloch raged and slew as tirelessly as any machine warrior that rose up before him, and with a far greater cold fury. His storm shield resounding with the blows of enemy weapons, while the black spear tirelessly slashed and stabbed, punching through armoured torso and severing mechanical limbs as he went. The Dark Overlord fought and killed his way towards the Minotaur's chapter master, leaving a trail of rent and severed terminators in his wake, until suddenly the tomb ship shook to a resounding blow, and it began to tilt crazily, the artificial gravity field within it rippling and buckling. The Necron Overlord was thrown unceremoniously to his knees, and looming there above him was ancient Geryon, the contempt of Dreadnought's great fist raised to strike the lethal energy field that enwrapped it churning soundlessly in the now airless vault. The hammer blow fell, but the Reaper's blade was there to meet it, and the Dreadnought's forearm exploded in flame and spinning shrapnel. The tomb ship tilted further still, and Geryon reeled and staggered, the Dreadnought's huge armoured feet skidding and losing purchase. The Overlord sprang bonelessly from the ground, and laid into Geryon with his great blade in a rapid series of two-handed slashes, sending splintered ceramite and showers of sparks fountaining from the wounded dreadnought. Geryon fell, one knee actuator severed, brackish blood and silvered amniotic fluids leaking from the rents in his armour. The overlord rose up to deliver the final blow, and the black spear found him. Morlock punched the ancient relic weapon clean through the overlord's back, and it exploded from the ankh glyph that was emblazoned across the Necron's chest, wreathed in pale flame and amber lightning. Transfixed, the Overlord spasmed under the spear, its death mask thrown back as if in a silent scream. Asteria Moloch smashed the Dark Overlord off his spear blade, using his storm shield to deal the blow, just as the tomb ship rocked again with fresh impact. The white flame of plasma fire licking around the aperture in the vault chamber from the void beyond. By a warrior's instinct earned on a thousand battlefields, Moloch reacted before his conscious mind detected the reaping blade falling from on high, raising his storm shield as the Dark Overlord's blade came down. The ancient device blocking a blow that would have cleaved Moloch's head in two before it finally shorted and spat, quickly coming apart under the repeated wild blows of the Necron's glittering blade. The world tilted once more, and they parted, Moloch feeling the burning cold hate of the deathless creature's bale from crimson eyes as the broken skeletal figure retreated into the darkness. The master of the Minotaur's chapter himself was swept out into the void, surrounded by the bodies of his dead warriors as if caught in a whirlpool.
The darkness shimmered as the vast shape of the stricken dead hand turned and blotted out the stars with its transit and began to accelerate away, revealing the burning hulk of the Minotaur's battle barge, Fidelitas Lambda, behind it. The ship's dying act had been to ram the dead hand, and in doing so, it had at last caused enough damage to force the colossal ship's retreat. With their master's vessel on the move, the Black Fleet disengaged, and driven off but hardly defeated, leaving only death and fire behind them, whilst in a move completely unanticipated, the Sun Killer and a dozen escort raiders unexpectedly split from the body of the Black Fleet and made a landing on the night side of Auric, whose face was soon consumed by dark storms and pulses of unnatural radiance. The rest of the surviving Necron ships and the wounded Dead Hand simply vanished without trace from the auguries of the handful of Imperial ships still able to track them. One second they registered, the next they were gone. The Necron host, if not defeated, had been checked. But for most of the survivors, that was a Pyrrhic victory at best. Battlefleet Orpheus was shattered. Less than 10% of his vessels were still in anything resembling fighting order, and every single one carried the scars of the battle. As to the rest of the Armada, it lay in vast arcing clouds of still burning hulks and tumbling debris. A pyre for the once glorious defenders of the sector visible across the entire star system. Amara Prime, although rid of its principal invasion force, burned still and was now the graveyard for billions. Such victories that had been claimed there had been bought at the most terrible price of all. Any surviving Imperial forces were evacuated as quickly as possible from the shambling ruins and pulled back to the outer worlds of Lemon and Calamar to regroup while the remnants of the civilian population were regrettably left to their fate. The Battle of Amara was over. <laughs>